Hello everyone. On behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage in TAC and the Intact Conservation Institutes, I extend a very warm welcome to our guest speaker, Tammy Hong, and everyone who has joined us for today's talk in the Conservation Insights 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Padma Roila, Director of ICI Delhi. Now to introduce our speaker, Tammy earned a Bachelor's in Art History, Studio Art and History from Syracuse University. As an art historian and an aspiring museum paper conservator, Tammy calls attention to the interdependence between tangible and intangible cultural heritage in her research and conservation work. She is currently the Andrew W. Mellon Artist Materials Research Assistant in Conservation at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. In her position at the National Gallery of Art, Tammy explores the dialogues between conservation science, materials manufacturing and artistry through cataloging artists' materials and associating important items at the Arts Materials Research and Study Center with the historical context. A project on Chinese ink sticks, uh, ink sticks in 19th century Britain examines the connection between Chinese and European ink traditions through the lens of artist materials, manufacturing pigments, and globalizations. The title for today's talk is Fluid Materialities, Chinese Ink Sticks, Reinterpreted in 19th Century Britain. The lecture is based on exploratory research that investigates the intersections of Chinese and European ink traditions. Tucked away in the treasure trove of collection items in the Art Materials Research and Study Center at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., is a 19th century color box from the well-known British artist supplier, Charles Robertson and Company. The box includes 10 color cakes embossed with a Robertson emblem, six brushes, a ceramic china tile, and a Chinese ink stick. A combination of artist materials representing a fusion of East Asian and European art practices. The speaker will discuss the aspects of carbon black materialities and the historical factors that contribute to the reconceptualization of Chinese ink sticks as Indian ink in 19th century Britain. Before I invite Tammy, may I please request all of you to mute your microphones. Please tap in your name, organization name, and email ID in the chat box, and also your questions. Those would be taken up right at the end of the talk. Thanks, Tammy. Over to you now. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming. And thank you to the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage for inviting me to present today. Um, I'm Tammy Hong, and I'm the Artist Materials Research Assistant in Conservation at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Um, my position at the gallery has given me the unique opportunity to explore the intersection between conservation science, materials manufacturing, and art history through uh, researching artist materials housed in the Art Materials Research and Study Center. Um, the items in this collection, from tubes of paint to manufacturing literature, are all primary sources that allow researchers to explore the ways in which historical and economic factors were interwoven with artists' materials and practices. Um, so, in the, um, so in this, so in this, so in this, mostly have modern materials, meaning that these materials uh, mostly date to the 1970s onwards. Um, and we mostly have American suppliers, um, but we also have um, a lot of international uh, suppliers uh, materials as well. So uh, mostly we have modern materials, but um, we also have several vintage materials um, like the Windsor and Newton Raffaelli oil sticks that you see on the screen there. Um, we also have paint sample slides of some of the paint tubes that we have for scientific analysis. Um, working closely with this collection made me realize how artist materials um, can help us unpack trans transnational narratives that are often overlooked in art history um, and in conservation. This project made me think deeply about the physicality of conservation documentation and the ways in which documented language and visuals used to record the cultural context of an artifact can affect the ways an object's significance is perceived for centuries to come. I found through my research that artist materials um, really reinforce the interdependence between tangible objects and also the transnational cultural context in which they are created. Um, and I personally think that it's something 
really important to remind ourselves of when we're researching and caring for cultural heritage. While I was cataloging items in the collection, I came across this 19th century presentation box from the British artist supplier, Charles Roberson and Co. The box includes 10 color cakes embossed with the Roberson emblem, six brushes, a ceramic china tile, and a Chinese ink stick from the ink studio of Wang Jingshen, which is one of the main Qing dynasty ink studios in China. This combination of artist materials represent a fusion of Chinese and British art practices, which are two very distinct aesthetic traditions. Considering when the box dates to, um, the box is in pristine condition. Furthermore, the materials all fit into their designated compartments, indicating that they were meant to be used together in some way. So for more context, um, the Yale Center for British Art also has two very similar Roberson boxes in their collection. The components in these Yale boxes are so similar to those in the National Gallery's box. Um, so this is one of the Yale boxes and you can see how there are color cakes also embossed with the Roberson emblem, um, the, the brushes and also a ceramic china tile um, in the bottom compartment and a Chinese ink stick is tucked away here. This is another uh, Roberson box from the Yale collection and you can see how there are also color cakes and instead of brushes, it has a pen nib. And here's also a compartment that houses a, a Chinese ink stick and a ceramic tile at the, in the bottom compartment. These Yale boxes further confirm that Charles Roberson indeed intended to include Chinese ink sticks in these boxes. These Roberson boxes were made for the Department of Science and Art, which was a British government sanctioned body that promoted education in art, science and technology um, and design in Britain and Ireland from 1853 to 1899. And these boxes were awarded to students who attended various British government schools. Several of the surviving boxes feature a long narrow slot at one end of the box that was reserved for an ink stick that can sometimes still be found intact. Now it is to this artifact, the National Gallery's Urberson box, a collection of the fundamental artist materials in 19th century Britain that this presentation turns. How are Chinese ink sticks more in Mandarin, a drawing and writing tool so indispensable in Chinese visual and literary culture incorporated into the standard art practices in Britain. Now, despite their Chinese origins, curiously, as a 19th century Roberson supplier catalog reveals, Chinese ink sticks were labeled as Indian ink. Um, so just a little research anecdote here. Um, so this was one of the first 19th century British catalogs I came across in my research. And what proved me to um, look further into this research topic was actually this specific ink stick here. Um, I can read the Chinese characters um, and this ink stick is actually printed upside down, which was really interesting to me, meaning that whoever made this catalog uh, overlooked the meaning of these characters. Um, and you will see how big of a role language plays in understanding ink um, throughout this project. Other British artist suppliers based in London, um, known as Colorman in the 19th century, also advertised Chinese ink sticks, solid carbon black pigment sticks from China as India ink or Indian ink. What we know as Indian ink today in Europe and North America is this, uh, which is a highly opaque carbon black liquid medium used for drawing, writing, and outlining. Um, and what's interesting, this is actually a bottle of Indian ink that I have at home that I use. And I wrote down all of the labels in the different languages. Um, and in English, it's black Indian ink. In French is Anche de Chine, which means Chinese ink. In Spanish, it's Tinta China Negra, which is also Chinese ink. Um, and then this is in German, um, which just says black ink. Um, so it's interesting how uh, Indian ink is different, um, in different in all of these different European languages. 
Though modern liquid Indian ink often contains other additives like shellac, its basic material composition and namesake were derived from the liquid Indian ink introduced by Windsor and Newton in the 1890s. In British Kellerman catalogs, liquid Indian ink was described as a liquid drying medium made from the genuine stick ink imported direct from China, a direct reference to drying ink prepared from Chinese ink sticks that were imported into Europe through the China trade. In China, Chinese ink sticks were first described in a 10th century treatise on writing materials titled Collected Studies of the Four Articles for Writing in a Scholar Studio, Wen Fang Si Pu, from the Song Dynasty. The modern understanding of Chinese ink sticks in China is heavily dependent on monographs and treatises on ink and ink making from the Song Dynasty to the Qing Dynasty. In the West, scholarship on Chinese ink sticks began in the early 1800s and continues to the present day. Now looking at this timeline, the National Gallery's Roberson box and all the boxes from Yale, they date to the 19th century, um, direct our attention to the moment in this historical time frame where the Chinese and European scholarship on Chinese ink sticks overlapped and also where the use of Chinese ink sticks in both Chinese and European aesthetic traditions intersected. While the focus of my presentation is the impact of Chinese ink sticks on British art practices, we must keep in mind that Chinese ink sticks were also used to produce a wealth of tangible evidence crucial to British empire building. British institutions, governing bodies, and companies that defined art production, economics, and politics all had meticulous record keeping practices. As the human geographer Miles Ogborn puts it, these records of communication in the form of writing are central to understanding the relationships between knowledge, power, and social change. Thus, Indian ink prepared Chinese ink sticks was used to document formulas of production, to catalog the transactions of commodities, and to record the interactions between people at the height of the British Empire. And here on the screen are just some examples of the documents from the English East India Company, just to show you visually how neat and organized record keeping was. Indian ink granted the wielders of the quill pen the ability to reinforce British dominance, particularly in India in the 19th century. In this presentation, I encourage everyone to think about the place of language and documentation in this whole story. To what extent did the terminology, methods, and imagery that the British used to record the understandings of ink in China or the lack thereof eventually lead to the reconceptualization of the medium as Indian ink? The Roberson box is indisputable evidence of the negotiations that underscored the mobility of artist materials between China and Europe a mobility that is understudied in comparison to other commodities of the China trade, like tea, porcelain, and silk. Drawing on the histories of the China trade and of carbon black pigments in China and Britain, I will now turn to how the Chinese ink stick was reinvented as Indian ink in Britain. How were British artists introduced to Chinese ink sticks? How did the materiality of Chinese ink sticks contribute to its reinvention as Indian ink? And how are Chinese ink sticks incorporated into British art practices and visual culture? These are some of the questions that I will address today in my analysis of the Roberson box in relation to the commodification and methodization of art making in Britain. Chinese ink sticks arrived in Britain by way of the British involvement in the China trade. At the beginning of the Qing Dynasty, Emperor Kangxi officially opened a number of ports that permitted foreign access in 1685. In order to exert more control over foreign trade, Emperor Qianlong established the Canton system, Yikou Tongshang, that confined all foreign trade to Canton, which is present-day Guangzhou. When considering the reframing of the Chinese ink stick as Indian think, as Indian ink, um, think about it in relation to how tea, which is another product indispensable to Chinese culture, and how 
it was exported to Britain and rebranded to create the British tea drinking culture we all recognize today. Um, moreover, it is also important to keep in mind here that despite Chinese export goods being immensely popular on the British market during this time, there was also a certain level of British anxiety associated with Chinese products. So for example, um, I've also come across British primary sources that reflect um, a sort of dismissive attitude towards Chinese values. Um, for example, I read a British source that regarded the Chinese tale about monkeys picking tea from the side of the Wu'i mountains, which is a very significant tale associated with the Chinese tea Da Hong Pao. Um, in this account, the British uh, primary source regarded the story as quote unquote ridiculous. Um, it's just important to keep in mind that these are just some of the British attitudes associated with Chinese goods that likely encouraged the rebranding of tea and perhaps also the rebranding of other Chinese products like the Chinese ink stick. Although it is difficult to pinpoint when Chinese ink sticks began traveling to Britain, archival sources of the China trade offered us clues to the patterns of exchange associated with the Chinese ink stick. Western supercargoes who participated in trade with China since the 18th century had a private trade allowance, which provided individual merchants the opportunity to earn money on a private basis without having to remit funds back to the country or company they worked for. In a letter written in 1756 by John Chambers, a British merchant, to his brother, the acclaimed architect Sir William Chambers, who famously designed the Chinese-inspired Great Pagoda at Kew, Chambers promised his brother that he would send him Chinese ink sticks via the lucrative private trade system. As the English East India Company expanded its maritime networks in the Indian Ocean, the colorman business flourished in Britain and in different parts of the British Empire, such as India. Products from abroad were implemented in the color experience experiments of London-based colormen like Charles Serverson, George Rowney, Reeves and Sons, James Newman, and Windsor Newton. Even prior to the 18th century, imported materials were sold at the London docks by ships, chandlers, and merchant importers at a location close to Reeves' first shop at 80 Hall Wormbridge. Um, here is a map of the 19th century addresses of the colorman um, I just mentioned, just to put the accessibility of these materials um, to the suppliers in perspective. The location of the docks location would be located somewhere near Point D, which is Reeves' first shop, um, likely on the River Thames. Relative to other Chinese export goods like tea, porcelain, and silk, Chinese ink sticks had significantly lower demand um, on the British market. Additionally, due to their compact solid forms, Chinese ink sticks were items easily included in private trade quotas and only a small quantity of them would have been exported at a time. The British acquired many concessions throughout China following the first and second opium wars that ended the Qing dynasty's control over foreign trade. Foreign industrial powers in China were able to freely import and export goods from their concessions. The Roberson box, along with the other boxes that contain Chinese ink sticks from the National Gallery's collection and also from Yale that I consulted for this project date to um, this time, which is the latter half of the 19th century. This suggests a correlation between the fortification of British influence on in China and the increasing number of Chinese ink sticks being imported into Britain. The solid stick form of Chinese ink allowed for it to last for decades without drying out and for preparing liquid ink from it as necessary. The carbon black particles in Chinese ink sticks required submersion in water while rubbing on an ink stone to be dispersed. And here is a video demo. The solution that was prepared from this process would then be applied with a brush. The term ink corresponds to two distinct concepts of ink in China and Europe. 
The term for ink in Mandarin, mo, refers to the solid ink stick, whereas in the European context, ink refers to an aqueous solution, and that doesn't translate. Now, to fully address the histories associated with ink in both its solid and liquid forms, mo shui and mo zhi, Mandarin terms that describe prepared ink, must be taken into account whenever researching these ink traditions. Colormen, artists and amateurs in Britain were aware that Indian ink was imported from China as solid sticks, even though Chinese ink sticks in their solid physical states were marketed in Colormen catalogs under a misnomer. The shortcomings in accommodating the concept of ink as a solid stick in the English language resulted in an inconsistent system in labeling the medium. So on the screen, we have Indian ink, India ink, best quality Chinese inks, and also best Nanking Indian ink. Some colorman catalogs dating to the second half of the 19th century labeled Chinese ink sticks as best Nanking Indian ink, a term that advertised the medium as a product familiar to British consumers while paying homage to its Chinese origin. Other color men neglected to mention the origin of Chinese ink sticks and continued to sell the medium as Indian ink. When liquid Indian ink was introduced by Windsor and Newton in the 1890s, the aqueous medium used liquid to specify the medium's physical state and to distinguish the product from Chinese ink sticks that were already sold as Indian ink. Despite Colorman being consistent with the British practice of meticulous record keeping, it is uncertain where the term Indian ink originated from. In a general history of China, Chinese ink sticks were already referred to as Indian ink. Written by the French Jesuit Jean-Baptiste Duhald and translated by the physician Richard Brooks, this volume observed that the best Indian ink, Chinese ink sticks, came from the Chinese city of Nanking. These terms likely influenced the naming conventions of Chinese ink sticks in Britain. Furthermore, Colorman catalogs visually differentiated Chinese ink sticks from liquid Indian ink, thereby contributing to the eventual separation of the narratives associated with these artist materials. The Chinese ink stick became part and parcel of British imperial history at a time when India had crystallized into Britain's most prized territorial acquisition. In a sense, the relabeling of the Chinese ink stick as Indian can be read as an orientalizing move for Eastern goods, be they from China or India, were often regarded as Oriental commodities. Their identity is interchangeable regardless of their place of origin. It might also be a means of claiming the ink stick as a British imperial product rather than a Chinese one. In this context, the very act of relabeling the Chinese ink stick, an inherently Chinese cultural symbol as Indian ink by color men, was a, means of was a means of exerting British imperial dominance. Composed of 90 to 99% carbon black particles, Chinese ink sticks are carbon black pigments. Carbon black, pan hei, by definition, is any pigment that contains some form of elemental carbon as its main or sole ingredient. Carbon black pigments are overall very stable and versatile. Moreover, they have high tinting strengths and are not easily affected by light or air. Their compatibility all other pigments makes carbon blacks highly desirable in an artist's practice. The composition of Chinese ink sticks includes carbon black particles, animal glue, and occasionally some additives. Though the sizes of ink sticks vary, the ink sticks will always be small enough to be held by hand. Distinct to different ink studios, the decorative elements of ink sticks were formed from the shapes and engravings of the molds used to make them. Here are just a selection of the Chinese ink sticks we have at the National Gallery, just to give you a sense of how, uh, of the various designs. A carbon black clay mixture was forced into a decorative and structured mold made of either wood or copper when it is still warm in the ink making process. Designs were engraved into the molds beforehand, so the ornamentations will appear in relief on the ink stick. 
here on the here are just some micrographs I took of the ink stick from the Roberson box, um, and you can see on this ink stick <clears throat> how the designs are uh, appearing in relief. And if you look really closely, you can actually see the wood grain of the mold. Once the ink sticks have thoroughly dried, <clears throat> excuse me. Once the ink are thoroughly dried, more painted and gilded elements will be added by hand. In China, Chinese ink sticks are considered paint. In contrast, in European art practice, the medium is classified as a watercolor due to its water solubility. Lamp black watercolor cakes are the most similar to Chinese ink sticks in terms of their source of carbon black particles and their solid physical states. Lamp black is a smoke black obtained by burning resins or resinous woods. The carbon black particles used in some Chinese ink sticks were and still are acquired in a similar way. Despite the similarities between Chinese ink sticks and lamp black watercolor cakes, studies on color from Britain revealed that the maneuverability of Chinese of Indian ink was superior to that of lamp black. As a result, Indian ink, the solution prepared from Chinese ink sticks, could be applied with a brush or quill pen in British watercolor drawings and also in architectural drawings. Um, so here I did some testing with a quill pen with some Chinese ink I prepared just to give everyone an idea of what the application might look like. The thickness of an Indian ink solution could also be adjusted to create various washes uh, with different intensities. For instance, a thick solution of Indian ink was commonly applied with a quill pen to outline the ornamental elements and calligraphy in illuminated manuscripts. A study of modern carbon black watercolors further demonstrated the superiority of Chinese ink sticks in terms of the medium's maneuverability and even particle dispersion when applied. Watercolor paint samples of carbon black pigments, bone black, ivory black, fine black, and lamp black were prepared by diluting the mediums with the gum solution. The purpose of the study was to compare the saturation intensities and versatilities upon application of these carbon black watercolors to those of Chinese ink sticks. Chinese ink was found to demonstrate a delicacy when transitioning from light to dark, unlike the saturated paint samples of the other pigments despite their dilution. Furthermore, cracking was observed with the naked eye of the surfaces of bone black, ivory black, and vine black um, due to the uneven dispersion of the carbon black particles in these mediums. And the cracking was not observed on the surface of the Chinese ink sample. In the Chinese ink making process, carbon black particles were mixed with an aqueous solution of glue and other additives to form a clay-like mass. The mixture is then steamed, sprinkled with water kneaded, rolled, and pounded before pressed into, a de pressed into decorative molds. The animal glue binder in Chinese ink sticks separates the medium from lamp black watercolor cakes and other carbon black watercolors that commonly use plant-based gum arabic as their binders. Though the origin of animal glue varied throughout sources, three types of raw materials were commonly cited, skins of large animals, deer antlers, and fish skins. Carbon black particles cannot adhere to the surfaces of paper on its own because these particles are hydrophobic. Thus, animal glue is required to facilitate the medium's even dispersion and adhesion to surfaces. Pounding the clay mixture not only ensures the thorough mixing of the components, it also forces the animal glue onto the hydrophobic surfaces of carbon black particles. This step, heavily emphasized in Chinese sources on ink making is pertinent in maintaining the even particle dispersion of Chinese ink sticks when the medium is applied. In the European understanding of carbon black pigments, lamp black is the flame carbon, meaning the source of the pigments carbon is the burning or paralysis of gas or oil. 
Historically, these flame carbons were produced by burning oils, fats, resins, wood, or similar materials at a wick or in open pans. Seen along these lines, Chinese ink sticks that were made from soot collected in the same way would also be considered a flame carbon. However, in Chinese ink studies, it is important to identify flame carbons by the source of their soot to fully understand the materialities of Chinese ink sticks. Soot ink, you yin mo, is produced from carbon black particles obtained by burning oil at a wick, while pine soot ink, song yin mo, is produced from carbon black particles obtained by burning pine wood. There are subtle differences in particle sizes and aggregations of the carbon black particles in Chinese insects of different origins. The smaller the particle size of carbon black pigments, the higher the tinting. Chinese insects smallest particles of any pigments other than organic colorants. Carbon black particles acquired from different sources require different animals to uh, carbon to animal glue ratios in the ink making process to accommodate their hydrophobic characteristics. Soot ink sticks have finer carbon particles than that of pine soot ink. There tends to be more animal glue in soot ink sticks, so the grinds, which is the top and the bottom of the stick, would have a sheen. The soot in ink stick's interior would have an obvious reflective quality when compared to pine soot ink sticks produced in the Qing Dynasty. Here are just some of the micrographs I took of two ink sticks from the color boxes um, in the materials collection at the National Gallery, just to compare the reflective qualities of their interior. So for my observation, the differences between um, these two ink sticks, you can see how this one has obviously uh, more of a reflective quality than that of this one. Um, this is what likely separates an ink stick that is made from carbon obtained my burning oil and one from burning pine wood. The further scientific analysis and research are required to identify the sources of carbon black particles in Chinese ink sticks exported to Europe in the 19th century. Despite being highly skilled technicians of color and pigments, uh, London colormen were unable to reproduce the delicacy and even particle dispersion that the Chinese ink stick offered in their imitations of the medium. The imitations of Chinese ink sticks made by London colormen were easily dis distinguished by their grittiness during preparation, their overpowering scent of musk, and the lack of delicacy and transparency during their application. The ingredients used to make Chinese ink sticks were similar to other carbon black pigments known in London and could have been sourced uh, easily locally. However, Chinese ink sticks were commercial items that depended solely on imports rather than domestic production. As a result, one can speculate that the unsuccessful British imitations of Chinese ink sticks owe their failures to the gaps in understanding the intricacies of the Chinese ink making process. Moreover, the lack of scholarship on the varieties of Chinese ink sticks imported into Britain is an indication of the ways in which the complexities of Chinese ink sticks as a Chinese cultural object were overlooked the moment they departed from China. British maritime nationalism led to the patriotic interest in art domestically. The contents of the Roberson box showcase the Chinese ink sticks relation to the evolving British attitudes toward art and society and culture. The importance of the Chinese ink stick in British visual culture was reinforced by the British arts education system, the growth of the amateur art market, and the practical demands of the British military. Art making was methodized and reorganized by the government schools of design um, and art in Britain. These schools, administered by the Department of Science and Art, regulated art practice and education that sought the implementation of a national curriculum in drawing, where the Chinese ink stick served as a fundamental medium in the practices of both professional and amateur artists. In the Roberson box, where the Chinese ink stick um, was expected to be used in watercolor drawing, um, instructions for use uh, for using the Chinese ink sticks 
were excluded from the suggestions for materials use um, inscribed on the interior of the box's lid. Additionally, British instruction manuals revealed that the preparation and use of the Chinese ink stick was foundational knowledge in an art student's repertoire. Art students were expected to know how to prepare Indian ink from its solid form with an Indian ink stone or with a plain stone plate at the beginning of their training in watercolor. Um, and interestingly, this is this process is very similar to how one would prepare a Chinese ink stick for calligraphy in China. Kellerman facilitated the commercial link between professional art and amateur art in Britain by selling prepared artist materials. Despite receiving praise from the professional art fields for maneuverability, the Chinese ink stick required time and effort to prepare. Towards the end of the century, liquid Indian ink was advertised as liquid drying ink prepared from Chinese ink sticks imported from China that allowed product users to bypass the preparation of solid ink sticks, of which some artists like Joseph Pinnell noted as tedious. One can speculate that the invention of liquid Indian ink was initially driven by the needs of artists and intensified by the desire to accommodate the amateur art market's demands for prefabricated mediums. The pivotal role of the Chinese ink stick in British art practices also extended to its use in the British military. With Britain's empire expanding across the world, military surveyors were assigned the task of recording the lay of foreign land and enemy fronts as swiftly and accurately as possible. Renowned watercolorist Paul Sambi was hired to be the drawing master of the first military academy, the Royal Military Academy at Woolwich, founded in 1741. Plan drawing, landscape drawing, and geometrical drawing became a part of the military academy curriculum ever since, and civil drawing was eventually introduced as well. One of the subjects that were tested in the examinations for direct commissions at British military academies was drawing. Students who excelled in drawing and sketching in secondary school were noted to have a visible advantage when entering the military academies. British military drawing was separated into two categories, drawing for information reconnaissance and panoramic drawings by military engineers. Drawing for information reconnaissance required rapidity, accuracy, and the ability to produce precise images while in motion. On the other hand, panoramic drawing was completed from a static position at a high vantage point to record an unexpected unobstructed view of the enemy front or of a landscape. The most desirable way to complete a sketch is with Indian ink and watercolors after the initial sketch and pencil. Indian ink and pen were used whenever possible to distinguish the most accurate outlines and annotations from the initial array of pencil contours. Moreover, Indian ink was advantageous in this process because it is a waterproof medium that would not smudge when wetted. The preparation of solid Chinese ink sticks was a time-consuming task in the military visual language. Under these circumstances, a prepared bottle of liquid ink would be a desirable medium to have as military personnel. British colormen were involved in providing drawing materials to military academies and distributing them abroad. The English East India Company's military school at Addiscombe, the counterpart school to the military academies at Woolwich and Sanders, trained officers to serve in the company's private army. George Rowney exported box sets of artist material to India to serve all the branches of the English East India Company during this time. The images on your left um, are some of the materials that were sent to the East India Company by George Rowney, um, and this is on their website. Um, and on your right is a Rowney color box from the National Gallery's collection um, that date to around this time to give you an idea of what the artist materials that were available and transported might have looked like. Um, and also a Chinese ink stick was included in the compartment here. Um, here I would also like to mention the
the interesting observation that the English East India Company actually didn't play a direct role in bringing Chinese ink sticks from China to Britain. Um, remember when we talked about the private trade quotas, um, but they did play a major role in the redistribution of the medium after it has been rebranded as Indian ink. Skillful amateur artists in their own right, British soldiers serving in India not only drew in Indian ink and painted in watercolor for their military responsibilities, but they also found landscape painting as a source of their own amusement while stationed abroad. At the peak of Britain's imperial power in India, drawing and landscape painting were highly valued skill sets of military personnel to document foreign land for military strategies and to distribute the visual imagery of India through the perspective of British colonialism throughout the empire. The dominance of the British military, particularly in India, likely contributed to the increased preference for liquid Indian ink over Chinese ink sticks due to the conveniences the solution provided under the military context. Since liquid Indian ink more appropriately suited the demands of British artists, the separation between the narratives associated with the Chinese ink stick and Indian ink was ultimately reinforced. A story that began oceans away from Britain in China with the Chinese ink stick, the contents of the Roberson box provide a gateway into the commercial, cultural, and artistic narratives that were outcomes of Britain's global presence. The artifact calls our attention to the ruptured linkages between the Chinese ink stick and Indian ink. The Chinese ink stick, along with its liquid form, liquid Indian ink, proved to be an indispensable drawing medium that contributed to the very foundation of 19th century British art at home and abroad. In Britain, the rich collection of instructions that describe application methods using brushes and quill pens to apply prepared ink strengthened the European concept of ink as an aqueous solution. On China, however, due to the Chinese ink sticks close relation to the art of calligraphy, the ritual of preparing Chinese ink sticks is still implemented to this day. The differences in the ways in which the solid and liquid forms of ink are valued in two very distinct aesthetic traditions today further highlighted the perspectives that um, consider the Chinese ink stick and liquid Indian ink as two different mediums. Here, I want to pose a few questions, um, just a little food for thought. Um, how might we consider, uh, how might we think about accommodating these different concepts of ink in our documentation and record keeping practices and cultural heritage preservation? Um, and how will these considers considerations of ink be addressed in our treatment decision-making when we are presented with a British watercolor drawing in Indian ink. Documentation produced in Indian ink by scribes and clerks contributed to the materialization of the British imperial identity. Britain's imperial narrative of viewing their overseas territories as a monolith was ultimately inked into our historical memory through the records that fortified the largely forgotten cultural ties between the Chinese ink stick and Indian ink. Moreover, due to Indian ink's wide circulation in Britain's overseas territories, especially in colonial India, the medium was coincidentally affiliated with its supposed ethonym, even though no evidence was found to indicate any relationship between India and Indian ink when the term was coined. Indian ink was used widely by soldiers who were stationed in India for reconnaissance work and for their own leisure. The visual and written records produced contributed to the rich array of images that encouraged the British imagination of India. The very act of reproducing the Chinese ink stick as a British artist material labeled and, uh, and subsequently documented as Indian ink eventually disassociated the medium from its cultural origin in China. Moreover, under this premise of imperialism, liquid Indian ink's wide circulation and use throughout the British Empire as a British product expressed a sense of British ownership over the medium. 
the namesake of Indian ink reinforced the othering of foreign lands that the British colonial memory motivated by conflating the Chinese ink stick symbol of Chinese culture with that of India in a time where India had transformed into Britain's most prized colonial possession. That said, the National Gallery's Urbison box was an artifact that contributed to the dismantling of the British imperial monolith used to define the distinct cultural identities of British territories, specifically India and China in this case. The Urbison box ultimately proved to be an important primary source that allowed us to credit all the cultural factors that contributed to the negotiations between artist materials by piecing together the intersections of Chinese and European ink traditions that are often seen as opposites in our perception today. Um, thank you again for um, everyone for attending and thank you for having me. Thank you, Tammy, for a very interesting talk. Uh, yeah. I don't see any questions. If you all have any questions, please do type them in. Um, I have one question. Uh, it's, it's again, what you were saying. So was there a, any Indian ink per se? Existence of an Indian ink per se? I mean, the, I understand the whole reinterpretation of Chinese ink sticks. Right. Uh, but do you then say that there was nothing like an Indian ink uh, existing? Um, and this, there might be, but I just haven't come across it in this mm -hmm. research project because mainly because through this research project we realized what Indian ink is not actually Indian. Mm -hmm. It was through this rebranding that um, was coincidentally affiliated with India, but what Indian ink was actually was from China. No, but the only thing is I feel uh, the, the fact that you're saying the Chinese ink stick was advertised as Indian ink also takes away a lot of credit from any Indian ink that was existing there, you know, within the Indian subcontinent. Right. So, I mean, because it's just That's a good point. of two different categories and selling it would actually also work in uh, the, you know, we work against both the cultural, uh, you know, both the items, even if there was an Indian ink existing and if it was a Chinese ink, which was relabeled as Indian ink, that's what I meant. So, right. Um, so, right. I think there, there is, but then um, I think that would just be another extension of my project because yes. I like trace it from China to Britain and then uh, touched on the redistribution in India. And I really think there was like a negotiation between the three countries during this time. And this is really exploratory work that I really <laughs> hope to continue to pursue, yes. but that is a good point. Yeah. Um, so uh, any questions, anyone? Please do type them in or let us know. No, I think that that went very well. I think it's one of the most organized. I don't see any questions except thank you for a very interesting talk. <laughs> so yeah, unfortunately, we were thinking there would be a nice, interesting question answer session, but no questions at all. Okay. <laughs> okay. So thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, thank you so very much. It was very interesting. Yeah. See you. Thank you so much for having me. Bye. Bye.